Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Sport Techies Managing Director Dan Kaufman, and I am very pleased to be able to introduce one of the first panel sessions, panel discussions for Horizon Summit 2020. This panel discussion is titled Using Research and Data to Power Your Return to Play Strategy, and it is supported by SAP Qualtrics. I'm going to give a quick intro to uh, the folks that we have up here to speak, uh, including our moderator, and then I will turn it over to the panel. Uh, please enjoy. So we have uh, Narcis Alakani. Narcis is Director of Marketing at Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. She leads the Hawks and State Farm Arena in advertising, marketing integration and operations and arena marketing efforts. She earned her MBA from Georgia State and prior to joining the Hawks, she worked for Turner Broadcasting and Hershund Family Entertainment. We also have Amy Hunter. Amy is Director of Customer Strategy at the Utah Jazz. And Amy is responsible for consolidating and analyzing data sources to create understanding and visibility into customer behavior in order to acquire and maintain lifelong jazz fans. And we have Rusty Parker. Rusty and his team at the Hawks were voted number one in the NBA in overall game experience among season ticket holders across a broad range of categories. He earned his PhD in applied sociology at Baylor and prior to his time with the Hawks, he spent over 10 years working in the research and data space with Sherpa Global and Shapiro Group. And last but not least, we have our moderator, Scott McIntosh. Uh, Scott is head of sports analytics and business development at SAP. He leads SAP's initiatives in the business intelligence and analytics space in North America as it relates to how teams and leagues manage their fan and player performance data. And he earned his master's in management analytics from Queens University and an MBA from McGill University. I will now turn it over to Scott. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming in here and, and jumping in on our session today. Uh, pleased to have you all here and engage in a really interesting conversation. Um, one of the things that, you know, if we look at things from a team perspective these days, uh, especially with the uncertainty around um, what coming back to play looks like, um, it's really all about experience management. You know, what does that customer actually get to experience as part of a game, whether that's at home, whether that's in the arena, or whether that's looking at it from a digital perspective. Um, and really the key to getting um, that experience in the right spot is, is getting a pulse on your fans, right? It's, uh, it's asking them questions at different times, uh, not just sending them a single survey once a week or once a month. Um, it's communicating to them in the ways that they wanna be communicated to, uh, whether that's through text, uh, whether that's through their, their movement through your digital landscape, uh, and lastly, it's going to the right segments and asking them the key questions that are gonna give you that information you want to really make those right decisions so that everybody coming down to experience your game, your event, uh, is having the time they want. So we'll get right into it. Um, as, uh, as Dan had mentioned earlier, um, lucky to have uh, Rusty on here from the Atlanta Hawks. And uh, as, as Dan was saying, I mean, you guys finished number one in game experience um, around the NBA. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about the process uh, that you use to really kind of collect and look at that data and uh, then what you did to kind of use that, use those insights to improve that in-game experience um, with the Hawks? Sure, thanks, Scott. Um, so a couple of years ago, we uh, renovated our entire arena from floor to ceiling and uh, it was great and so we wanted to really make sure that we were asking folks the right questions about our new space. So we uh, took our old post-event, post-game survey and completely revamped it, um, restarted to make sure that we were measuring the new experience. Um, and so we got, we got really detailed in there, which was great for us. Uh, not always as, as good for the, for the respondents. It turned into a long survey, but it resulted in a ton of data for us. And uh, I, I looked through it every week and uh, we, we started to hold what we call after action meetings with department heads throughout the organization from marketing to operations uh, to revenue to sales uh, everybody that we could get in the room and every week we would spend um, an hour and a half to two hours going through all the things that we see popping up around the arena and the first half of that meeting was dedicated to going through survey results seeing 
okay, this metric didn't hit as high as we wanted it to this week. What's going on? Let's dive into that number, see um, some sub questions in there to see if we can really get at it. Or let's dive into the open ends to see what people are really talking about that we might not have noticed ourselves. Um, and so I was really excited that uh, the team was so open to using the data that we were able to collect from our, our fans to really make quick changes and improvements throughout the arena and improve their experience. Oh, makes sense, Rusty. I, and I think that's one of the things, you know, is, is how do you get all the right people in the room to look at their, their areas, right? So they're making changes, not in terms of the entirety of the building, but concentrating on their focus areas. Um, can you give me maybe some examples of, of, of some of the things that came out to you uh, through this research um, and then you were able to achieve some really positive results by putting it into action? Yeah, um, so, you know, we, we came up, we came across things at every meeting. Um, a couple of the big ones that stand out to me were our, uh, our fan friendly pricing. When we opened the arena, we decided to to put some really popular items uh, and when it comes to food and beverage at lower prices. Uh, things like $2 waters, $3 hot dogs, and uh, very popular $5 beers. Um, and we did a big marketing campaign about that. We were really excited about it. And as the survey results started to come in, we see more and more people saying, hey, I heard about this, uh, these fan-friendly prices, but I'm not seeing it anywhere in the arena. Or uh, even worse, we would hear that uh, they're seeing deals like that at Mercedes-Benz Stadium next door to us where the Falcons play, that they're seeing things like that there. And we should really think about moving to their model for pricing. <laughs> so we need to make some changes. Um, and so we decided to put fan-friendly priced items uh, at more stands throughout the arena. And we also changed some of the creative on the, on the signs to make sure that they were well advertised and that they were very clear when somebody stood in line that there would be fan-friendly priced items there. Um, another big one or a little one that uh, could have a big impact on experience was folks said that some of our new stat boards that we'd placed in the corners of the arena, that they were having some trouble reading it, that the font size might be a little too small. Um, and so we were able to work with, with our, our in arena team and they were entirely amenable to it. They want the fans to have the best experience possible and see all the cool stuff that our players are doing. So they made some tweaks and uh, it's, it's, it's been a great change that, um, that we've been able to carry forward. Yeah, great to hear. I think that's something that we all kind of get caught in our own bubble sometimes where we make a decision uh, based on all this data, then we push it out and we just assume everybody's going to actually be able to consume it in the way we imagine. That's why it's you know, obviously so important to ask those questions and get that feedback. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit about uh, how technology kind of helps you throughout the process? Sure. Um, we started using Qualtrics to, to send out our surveys and we've been super happy with it. Um, you know, when we were deciding where to go, uh, which, which platform we wanted to use for our surveys, we really wanted the best possible experience for our respondents. And in my opinion, uh, Qualtrics provides, provides that, that it makes surveys um, attractive and really easy to take. So there'd be fewer breakoffs and higher completion rates. Um, they're also really great for the analytics team on our side that uh, they make programming the surveys very easy um, and intuitive. They, we made great use of the quick online reports that we're able to provide for our clients around the organization. And uh, they, it enables for automatic export for, of data into uh, our statistical packages when we need a more detailed analysis or if we wanna make a, a dashboard in Tableau, it's, uh, it's made my life a lot easier. <laughs> I can imagine. I do remember from my time in the industry, it's, it used to be you ask people for information and it's kind of stayed in one spot. So it's nice to be able to, to get into things and play around with it yourself. So good yes. to hear. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for that, Rusty. So um, I'll move over. Uh, Amy, a couple of questions on your side. Um, obviously, a lot of different technologies um, that get pushed out to you as, as somebody who works on the team side. Um, in terms of how you gather your research and information and whatnot. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen, I guess, um, that have made some of the different options you've looked at a little bit better than others? Yeah, thanks. Um, honestly, I, I really appreciate Rusty kind of set that up perfectly for me um, because there are a lot of different sources of information that we have to deal with. 
and a lot of different softwares that house the information that's important. And not only is that information important in and of itself, but it's important that we find ways to let it interact with, with everything else. Um, so like Rusty, we actually switched over to Qualtrics about three years ago ourselves. Um, we were on a technology before where we were sending out surveys regularly, but essentially all we were using it for was to send the survey and house the survey data. And that was it. Um, and so while that's great, and it's great to have information about what our customers were saying, um, it was really important to us to find a way to integrate all of that technology. Um, and while we all wish that we had unlimited BI resources all the time, so we could have everything beautifully integrated and working, um, it was really important to us that we had something where we could just connect all of those different data points. And it was easy to integrate and there were ways of making sure that we were collecting that information in the best way possible. Um, so that's, Qualtrics has been really great for us on that regard. And especially because uh, to Rusty's point, we have been able to integrate that internally to people who normally would not look at that information. Mm -hmm. And so like the, the information's great, but if I'm the only person looking at it and I'm the only person that's in it every single day, it doesn't matter because ultimately there's only so much that I can kind of say to people and try to convince people what people are saying. And it's a yeah. much more compelling story if they actually have the access themselves to the data and they can see what those trends look like and kind of, um, they're, they're even coming to their own interpretation of it as opposed to having me come to them and say, hey, have you seen this? Like, yep. this is what the customers are saying. It makes it a much more compelling story when they're finding it themselves. Yeah, yeah, you're not having to do any convincing. They, they've already yes. convinced them, themselves when you have that first conversation. So what kind of changes, I guess, have you seen in some of those different departments that have, that have been a result of them really getting in there and playing with the data? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of things. Um, people kind of making the changes themselves, uh, being the ones behind it because they wanna see those scores go up. But mm -hmm. going back to kind of the technology question even, um, one of the things that we have utilized a ton within Qualtrics is their ticketing system. If you think of like a help desk, you know, if you send in a help desk ticket to have something fixed on your computer, Qualtrics has that kind of internal system where you can have tickets sent to people and you have tracking and you can make notes on it. And we use it internally, but for our customers to use to communicate with us. So essentially we have surveys either that we send out after games, or we also have one that's live anytime we have an event at our arena. And mm -hmm. if customers indicate that they would like somebody to reach out to them, the system automatically creates a ticket. And then it will even look to see what area of their arena experience they, they had problems with and automatically send that ticket to whoever's in charge of that. Um, and so one, that means there's, it's very hands-off, the system kind of runs itself, but more importantly, like we're, you know, we're getting it to the vice president of arena marketing. We're getting it to the director of guest services. We're getting it directly to the head of security. So that there, if there's a problem during an event, they can solve it immediately. But then if there's a problem after the event, they can call them and the head of security is talking to you about the issue you had getting into the arena. And so like just one really quick example that we had was um, our guest services director really use, uses this data a lot to understand where training practices need to be updated because a lot of times he will be in the data and he will see the consistent feedback that people are saying about interactions with guest services people that maybe aren't ideal. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's empowering people to feel like they can really make a good change or telling them, hey, kind of back off on people if they're sitting in the wrong seat for five minutes because it's not that big of a deal. Like, so, so just kind of helping people understand what they can do. Yeah, which is massively important for teams, right? Because you've got your full-time staff, but your game day staff is often just there once or twice a week. So how can you continue to monitor those, those people that are coming in and out and, and make the changes that you need? Um, so, I mean, I know from my time in the industry, one of the biggest challenges was always, you know, you have a lot of different technologies and they kind of play in their space. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, how you guys have been able to really integrate everything um, together so that you're, you're grabbing information from other areas and, and really um, allowing you to make the right decisions and, and draw insights from your use? Yeah, yeah, totally. So uh, we've really been trying hard to kind of understand the entire customer experience. Um, of necessity, a lot of times you end up getting a little siloed where like people are focused on their own individual things and we're trying to take a step back and really understand the entire customer process. 
Um, so one of the things we've done is starting started integrating like our ticketing data into Qualtrics so that as we're analyzing surveys, we can see trends. If there are certain areas of the arena, like this is a, a side note from the from the NBA, but we also have concerts in our arena and we own our arena. So a lot of times if we have sound feedback that's bad, we want to know if it's all coming from the same four sections. And th those are the people who have really bad sound experiences or things like that. And because we can integrate the ticketing data in, it's easy for us to spot, hey, we're getting a lot of complaints about the ushers in this section. Like maybe that's something we should confront. Um, the other thing that's really great for us is we um, use Microsoft Dynamics as our CRM system. Mm -hmm. And we have season tickets who are the lifeblood of our organization and we love them and we wanna take care of them. So what we've started doing is actually pushing the survey data that we get into CRM. So when the service reps are trying to help out their customers, they can see what types of experiences their customers have had, if they've recently had a really negative or a really positive interaction. We even use it to create customer profiles through Qualtrics that then get pushed into CRM. So we can ask them, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And when's your birthday? And we can show up at your seat on your birthday with a chocolate ice cream cone, right? Like whatever it is. From big to small changes, that's been really great. <laughs> and then also um, we have a great integration into Domo, which is our visualization technology that we use across the company. So even people who don't have access to Qualtrics because it's not necessarily something that we would need them to access, they can see all the trends and they can see that with like our wins and losses. They can see that with um, whatever type of data we feel is relevant. It can all come together and, um, and make sense to people. Oh, thanks. I oh, appreciate that, Amy. Um, so we'll head back over to, uh, to nurses at the Hawks. And I think this is a question that, um, I know I got a lot of messages from people around the industry wondering, what are you gonna talk about when it comes to return to play? And what does that look like? Um, and I know that's something that's in, on the top of everybody's minds uh, inside the industry. So maybe uh, Narcissus, if you wanna walk me through a little bit of uh, the things that you're looking at as you try to answer some of those questions about um, what it's gonna look like and, and what you wanna find out before you start moving through the process of creating that return to play. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I think we're all very eager, eager to return back to play. So some of the questions um, that have come up um, really center around the fan and the employee experience as well. And it's all stems around understanding the overall sentiment um, around COVID-19 and the measures um, that we would need to um, make in order to make uh, employees and fans um, feel more comfortable. And um, from a fan standpoint, more specifically, we um, are seeking to understand their level of concern around COVID, um, when they will feel comfortable returning to live events, um, what measures that would need to be in place to make them feel more comfortable, and then what changes that we would need to make around um, specifically the food and beverage experience, including ordering payment methods, how we adapt our premium space. Because um, as Res Rusty mentioned earlier, we um, did a big arena renovation a couple years ago, really focusing on um, that communal fan experience and um, just having a good time. So these fan insights are definitely key in how we're adapting our operational strategy to make fans feel more comfortable. And once we've laid out that strategy from a marketing standpoint, the question is how do we communicate these precautions that we're taking um, to fans in a way that's informative, but not intimidating? Yeah, a big question, right? And, and I think it's, it goes back to some of the things that we've talked about uh, previous uh, in our conversations, really about experience management. Not everybody uh, wants that same experience. Some people are fine going in even with COVID out there and sitting beside somebody else. Some people want to be 10 seats apart or, or four rows behind. So how is it that um, you guys have really been able to kind of build some kind of an infrastructure to look at different segments um, and go after some of those questions um, and then draw those insights into specific areas so you can, um, I guess, adjust the experience for, um, you know, your season seat holders versus your casual fans, things like that. Sure. So we, we decided early that we didn't want to go out wide with these surveys um, during a troubling time. Um, so we actually, luckily, um, a couple months um, prior, or maybe even a month prior, Rusty, my, my time's running all together, uh, we developed something that we call the Fan Council. And um, the Fan Council is a group of 900 fans who had previously agreed um, to taking surveys for us 
um, in an effort to help shape our fan experience. So um, fans are the lifeblood of our organization. And, um, you know, we take that um, number one ranking for game experience very seriously. So we want to make sure all the decisions that we're making, we are making in the lens of a fan. Um, so we launched the Fan Council this past spring uh, utilizing Qualtrics XM directory platform. And uh, we went out to this group initially um, with the COVID-19 uh, tracker um, back in April. And um, when we developed the Fan Council, we, we focused on um, three key segments. So season ticket members, um, individual ticket buyers, as well as non-ticket buying fans. So fans that have interacted with us at community events, um, given us their information, but haven't yet bought a ticket. Um, and we developed a recruitment survey um, designed to build a profile around each of these fans that we would kind of um, build upon through future surveys. Um, mm -hmm. And we built this fan council, we developed a roadmap of, map of interactions to learn more about our fans, um, and COVID happened. Um, so we quickly had to pivot from this plan because it didn't really make sense to, to go out to them with um, these planned interactions we had but it actually worked out perfectly to have this group of fans that had um, previously opted in um, to, to give us their feedback. Um, so we started uh, the COVID tracker survey um, with the fan council in April, and we've seen higher engagement rates than we typically would with um, sending surveys to our entire customer base. And um, the response has been really good. So um, we've decided to, to kind of go out larger um, I'm focusing on members, um, again, those premium buyers, because all of our premium spaces have, you know, the beautiful buffets with the, you know, gourmet food um, that we're, we're going to have to adjust. Um, so, so right now we're focusing on um, sending this survey out in waves um, to see how responses change over time as more information comes out. And uh, we've developed a dashboard to track those results um, month um, side by side um, to see the trends. And so far, the trends are positive. And for those of us um, like me who are itching to get back to live events, um, the trend that we're seeing is that the level of concern is, is going down. And um, as people are getting more educated about the measures that businesses are taking um, to keep their patrons safe, um, fans want to see more of that. So that's what we will focus on. Thanks, Narcissus. Um, and I guess sticking with the, the theme of uh, the return to play, um, Amy, I know you had mentioned um, um, in our conversation yesterday, you know, what are some of those things that you want to ask right away and what are some of those things you kind of want to wait on and what's been, what's been your strategy with the Jazz on, on looking at return to play? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been an interesting conversation um, and frankly, uh, within our company, you know, we are Larry H. Miller Sports and Entertainment, which includes a minor league baseball team, it includes a G League um, a uh, basketball team and it includes a bunch of megaplex theaters um, all of which we're facing this question of when do we reopen how do we reopen what does it look like how how much should we ask our fans um, I know that one of the big concerns internally has been um, the fact that at the end of the day a lot of what we are going to do is going <clears> to <throat> excuse me is going to have to be signed off by the NBA and there was initially some like we don't want to ask our customers something that we can't implement, you know, like that's not really helpful to them. And that's going to make them feel like, why did you even ask me if you weren't actually going to do any of the things that we said? Um, yeah. So internally we have been very slow to kind of make that first step. Um, but this is really helpful for me to kind of, I love hearing what you guys have been doing. Um, and I don't mean to like call out another team or whatever, but the, we spoke with the Indiana Pacers last week as well. And they have seen some really great early results from their surveys that they've been sending as well. And one of the things that I think is really uh, valuable, and Nars has talked about this, is seeing how those emotions and things change over time. Because we are learning so much as we go. You know, mm -hmm. even two weeks ago, we had no idea what the end of the season was going to look like. And we finally have clarity around that. Um, yep. We still don't really know what next season is going to look like. And so... I think it's important now to understand like how are you feeling what type of information do you have and also like who's important to you to get sign off on coming back like who's who who saying you should you can go back to an arena now is yeah. actually going to make people feel comfortable and that's that's an interesting question we have you know and we want to know now yeah. how do you feel in a month how do you feel in three months how do you feel about that and kind of make sure we're staying on top of that yeah no i 
I mean, uh, the million dollar question that we're, uh, we're yes. all trying to figure <laughs> if out. If anyone figures out. that out, please let me know because I'm still trying to figure out who I trust as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so in all this process, um, I think, you know, and one of the things that we always talk about is, um, you know, in the sports industry and in every industry is, you know, um, making decisions based on, you know, your wisdom, the things that you thought were the right way to do things versus um, sometimes actually getting feedback from people who have a different perspective than you. Because sometimes we're so close to our, the product when we're inside the industry um, that we don't see uh, some things that other people might be mentioning to us. Any of you sort of have some things that have come up through your experience in, in, in research and looking at data that really surprised you about what the fans wanted or what their issues were? Um, versus what you thought they might be? I don't think any surprise. I think uh, one thing, and again, I hate to call out the Pacers because it's their data, but they said I could share it. So, <laughs> but um, both that and then also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I actually, uh, I'm a huge theme park fan and I got a survey from Universal Studios asking me, when would you come back to a theme park? And a couple of things that I found interesting were, um, you know, the, one of the things I mentioned was the question of like, whose sign off would you need to come back? And, you know, they had things in there like local government, federal government, everything like that. Ultimately what people want is they want a medical person to tell them that it's okay. They want a doctor, they want, um, yeah. you know, they want the medical board, they want the local medical board who knows exactly what's going on in this area to give them the sign off from that, um, which I thought was really interesting and opens up some potential interesting opportunities since a lot of our sponsors are healthcare providers. You know, is there some type of thing where we could get a, a community board going with them where they could sign off on it? And then really quickly, the other thing that I found was really interesting is um, not just the decisions and the changes that we make, but our customers are really concerned about how we're going to communicate that to them and how they're going to understand exactly what they're going to face the first time they come back to the arena. Um, and that was interesting to note, like they're very concerned about not wanting to show up and be surprised by the procedures, but to be totally comfortable and know exactly what to expect. And uh, you know, how do we communicate that to them is now kind of our biggest question, making sure that they know so that they're comfortable coming back. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I think we got to still a couple of minutes left here. So here's one I know for a lot of teams, you know, sometimes you own and run all the uh, different areas of your arena and sometimes you don't. Um, so question from the audience, um, how do you influence, you know, fan friendly concession pricings or, you know, just service uh, when the concessions might be run by an outside vendor or maybe parking or looking at different areas? How do you bring them into the, in, into the you know, decision making process? Sure. So, um, you know, that's not, not totally my area as a, the research guy, but, you know, I know that there were just a ton, a ton, a ton of conversations um, that it's a very really collaborative relationship that we have with our, our uh, food and beverage provider, Levy, um, about what, what prices are going to be, what the menu is going to look like. Um, and we knew that this was a model of fan-friendly pricing that we were really, really interested in, in moving to. And they ran all sorts of models, did all sorts of analysis, um, and then in the end decided that this was something that would be okay, that Levy decided this would work for them, that we decided this would work for us. Um, so it's it's all just a conversation and again, trying to trying to do what we can to make the, the best possible experience for the fans. Potentially, I would think, even if it take, means taking a little bit of a hit on the, on the bottom line. Yeah, just as a quick side note, um, I've had a similar, we've had a similar experience because we own very little of the parking around the arena. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but obviously people want to tell us if they have a bad parking experience. So we have just worked really hard to try to develop those relationships with those parking centers and with the corporations that own them to try to help them understand, like, we love having you be our main parking person. Are there things we can do, you know, just for example, at the end of the game, having to pay on your way out means that our fans are sitting there for two hours and nobody's happy about that. Um, and so uh, just trying to uh, develop that and help them understand like there are solutions. How can we help find a good solution that you're still getting what you need, um, but we can help our fans have a better experience. And most people are really, they want, they want it to work too. 
yeah, we're, we're, we're all in it to find something better coming out on the other side of all this, no doubt. Um, yeah. So another question here from the audience. Um, you know, we had talked a little bit about uh, bringing other people from the organization into the process of playing around with the data and, and, and drawing some of their, their own insights. How have you been able to, to make that happen inside your organization? It's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, maybe share some of those secrets for some, some of the other people out there in the industry. For us, uh, you know, from the, from the outset with our after action meetings, it came from the top down that our CEO and uh, COO were heavily involved. We're sitting in on these, these two hour meetings to walk through um, the minutia of what's going on at these events. And so, you know, if the CEO and the COO are gonna make time to be at this thing, then everybody else needs to make time to be at this thing. Um, they just went to show through their actions how important it was. And, and that's, you know, that's kept up for, for two years now and it's, it's been great. Yeah, the total top down, like it has to come from the top and the people at the top have to show that they care and that it's important to them. Um, but the great part kind of as a follow up to that is once people knew that they had to be there and um, we've had some great kind of suggestions to make things more, you know, more valuable. It used to be that I kind of ran the meetings and then our vice president of arena marketing said like, hey, let's make it so the people who actually influence this are the people in charge of those areas. So I am only there to like answer questions and now everybody else actually reports on their own areas and they get passionate about it. And they're the ones who come to me and say, hey, could you do a deep dive on this data? Cause like, I think I see this, can you confirm that for me? Um, yep. And so because it was important to our CEO and our president and everybody else, it became important to everybody else and they started truly owning it themselves. It's been amazing. No, it's great to hear. Um, I guess last question, I think um, that we've got a little bit of time for. So how, how, much, how much resources, I mean, everybody always talks about collecting all this information and you know, doing a bunch of analysis on it. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, how, much, how much resources actually goes into um, looking at the responses from the surveys, um, just to make sure that you're getting a good ROI on, on looking at that data without wasting too much time inside of it? It's a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We, we send out a survey after every game, after every concert. Yeah. We get a boatload of responses and uh, we ask a lot of open-ended questions in there as well. So we have a nice Tableau dashboard uh, set up that, you know, puts everything visually and folks can filter and look at events as, as they see fit. And then there's just a section that you have to scroll, scroll, scroll through of open ends. And, um, before every ever before every after that before every after action, uh, I look through all those. Um, I know that our director or vice president of guest services looks through those, um, and we we try to pull out the stories that uh, will help shed some light on what we're seeing in the numbers. And then also, if we see a, a big one off that we didn't know about, uh, then we'll talk about that as well. So. It definitely takes some time, but uh, I've, I've found that it's been great for, for driving conversation and um, uh, bringing some, some color to just the, the numbers that we're looking at otherwise. Yeah, I mean, same for us. And, and just uh, like from an ROI standpoint, um, one of the things that we really try to do are some of the things I talked about earlier, like integrating it into our CRM, making sure that if we're asking a question, people are actually seeing it and there are questions that can be, the action can be taken on. Um, from like a resource standpoint, I mean, the, the, the customer experience department is me because, <laughs> because what we want is for the other departments to care enough that they are the ones looking through those individual feedback. So yes, I do go through every single piece of open-ended feedback that we get. Um, but more importantly, those department heads go through every single piece of individual feedback that they get. Um, and so like a resource standpoint, it's not super heavy, it's, but it's also really important to understand what the software can do. And uh, you know, historically we've been content to just send and get it back and then you know, I send out like a spreadsheet email to everybody. And this past year, we've really tried to focus on like, what can this do for us? And let's make sure we're actually utilizing it properly as you, as you have to with every software, right? But, uh, but in particular, this one. Yeah, so true, so true, Amy. Um, so I think we can oh, we can go through the last question. I think people will move on on their own to the next uh, next panel. So 
uh, here's an interesting question from uh, from Chris. Um, so without a, an actual fan identity, how do you guys uh, sort of make sense of the fact that you know the survey information is relevant um, and really try to segment it out so you're you're understanding what is actually uh, valuable uh, data coming back from your guests um, at the venue? That's, I mean, that's such an interesting question. I was trying to glance through the Q and A's while still focusing on what was being said. And somebody mm -hmm. mentioned in particular, like what people say and what people do are always going to be two different things. Um, and, and so it's hard to tell and it's hard to know. Um, on some level, we kind of say like, well, we can only, all we know is what people are telling us. So on some level, we just have to kind of trust what they're saying and give them the grace to say like if they're having great or really negative experiences and understanding that most people who answer the survey had either a really great or really bad experience and that's okay um because we're still getting a benchmark on it um but uh you know but but it's it's definitely a it's definitely a challenge it's something that we talk about and it's something that we i don't know that we have a great great answer for at this point um we're still trying to figure that out. We're still trying to, to figure that out, what that means to us and, and um, how can we truly, how can we truly impact the customer experience based on the information we can get from them? Yeah. It's also sports is, is, is a tough industry sometimes because there's never an apples to apples when it comes to year over year, season over season or game over game, right? So we also have to look at everything like, did the Hawks win this game or were we down 20 points in the first half? Um, which, which never happens. Um, you know, Not for think, us either. But that, yeah, but that, that really makes the difference as to the overall experience that people are reporting and, or if they had a, you know, a bad parking experience at the beginning of the night, that can also affect the, the scores they're giving um, about the food and beverage or the entry and exit and security ratings throughout the rest of their night as well. Yeah, I can tell you what our NPS drop looks like when we lose. I can tell you exactly how many NPS <laughs> points I can knock off the score when we lose, so. Yeah. Winning and losing does matter a little bit. Well, thank you so much. I know we're, we're at the end of time now. So first off, um, thanks, thanks for all of you, um, Rusty, Narcissus, Amy, for, uh, for joining us to, to talk through this. And for all of the uh, participants out there, um, you know, uh, gonna be lots of, lots of great opportunities coming out on the other side of all this uh, within the sports industry. So uh, keep reaching out to people and um, keep, keep staying positive and learning during uh, this little break we have in life. Um, and uh, we're all going to come out on the other side of it in a much better spot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.